Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the last uh, speaker of today. But just before I do that, um, I've recently just heard that Living DNA is now accepting transfers from Family Tree DNA and from the other companies. And not only that, but uh, it would actually help uh, contribute to their Irish DNA Atlas project that they are running themselves. This is still working, yes. So if you do want to transfer your um, autosomal DNA data to Living DNA for free, then please go and see them at the Living DNA stand just here. Right, well, the, and here are the, the uh, representatives of Living DNA as well. So just uh, look out for the ladies and the gentlemen with We Are All Made Up of All of Us written on their sweatshirts. So, <clears throat> so last speaker of today is Paddy, uh, Paddy Waldron. Paddy is Chairman Emeritus of the Clare Roots Society. He is an intrepid genealogist, and um, he comes from, of course, County Clare, where Listoon Varna is well recognized as the matchmaking capital of the world. But Paddy has now actually thrown DNA into the mix, so if you thought it was bad beforehand, prepare to be shocked. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Paddy Walton. Thank you, Morris. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to everyone who's here. Welcome to all those who are watching on Facebook Live. I hope some of the people whose family trees are going to be mentioned here might be watching from Chicago and Cincinnati and all sorts of places. I have put my notes up on my website. If you want to just take down that address, pwalder.info forward slash ggi2017. There's also a link on my Facebook page and in the Genetic Genealogy Ireland. Facebook group where the live streaming is going out. Um, this is a bit like my first experience with Toastmasters. Morris asked me back around July would I like to give a talk, and then he sent me the program which had the type of matchmaking in there using autosomal DNA and Y DNA, and I figured, well, I'm going to try and make up a talk on that topic at short notice. It was at least six months' notice rather than ten minutes, which I think you get in Toastmasters. Um, and then about three months later, he wrote to me and said, you never sent me your title. And I said, I thought you sent me my title. So anyway, I said I'd talk about the title that he made up for me. So as he said, I'll say a little bit about matchmaking. Is that big enough or do we need to blow it up a little more? Can you read that down the back? That might be better. Can you read that down the back? Yes, I got a thumbs up from the back. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about matchmaking as it is today, then I'll go back to matchmaking as it was in the period in which our ancestors lived, then a few other lessons about using DNA to do novel things with X chromosomes, a little bit about the theory of six degrees of separation, summary, and then I'll go on to the Y-DNA results that we've got from the Clare Roots project. So Liston Varna has this annual matchmaking festival which has been held traditionally every September for many, many years. All the Clare farmers from the Harvest was in would go off to Liston Barna to find a wife. And they're already planning for 2018. You can visit the website yourself. People come to Clare to find their ancestors from the past as well as their spouses for the future. Thousands of people come in search of their Clare roots. Um, Willie Daly is the famous traditional matchmaker, third generation matchmaker in Liston Varna. His live website is a little bit slow, but his face will pop up there in a moment. Uh, he has this magic book, which he has inherited from his grandfather, listing all the eligible men and women that he tries to match up. And there's a pub in this environment called the Matchmaker Pub. And according to his website, he has his office in a corner of the Matchmaker Pub. Down in the back row is my good friend Michael O'Connell. Uh, Michael and I. Well, I'm the official administrator, but Mike should really be a co-administrator of the Clare Roots Project. I didn't even know you could do these diagrams until I saw Margaret and James put them up earlier today. The Clare Roots Project has existed at Morris's suggestion since he came to give us a talk in there in November 2015. And it's been slowly growing up that live feed now says we have 842 members. There is one big blip here in March. Uh, which was when FTDNA sent me out a box of 50 kits, and instead of putting them in the DNA Outreach Ireland project, which they usually do, they put them in the Clare Roots project. Actually, most of those ended up being used in Mayo when I gave a talk in Mayo, so we had to take them out of the Clare Roots project again. 
But we have our office in the corner of the bar in the Stella Maris Hotel in Kilkee, and we entertain there the people who come and search in their roots. That is a picture of the Lynch family from Sacramento in California who came over last November. There are seven siblings in that family. They have all tested the various DNA projects, uh, various DNA companies. They have no idea where their grandfather Eugene Lynch came from until they got the DNA results back. And it didn't take much looking at the DNA results before we were able to tell them your grandfather must have come from the town of Mobine in County Clare because you have a lot of third cousins with Lynch ancestors whose ancestors lived in that townland. And we were able to confirm that by looking at OD matches as well, which was another side. And so you're definitely descended from Michael Lynch and Mary OD, who married in about 1820, because you match the cousins of both the Lynch side and the OD side. So this is my cousin Maureen, who on the other side is a cousin of the Lynches, and this is Michael here and myself in the background, and the group of six that came from California to Clare as soon as they discovered that their ancestors were from West Clare. Uh, this was another group that we met in May. Some of these people in the front happened to be here just for a family gathering organized by somebody for the descendants of a couple who lived uh, in one more near Kilrush in the 1800s. There's me in the background, and Mary Ellen here had actually found me through the Ireland Reaching Out project, which I'm also involved in, which is another way that people find where in Ireland did their ancestors come from and get local help from local volunteers. Uh, we find nowadays most people start out with the DNA and find the parish in Ireland through the DNA rather than through the Ireland Reaching Out. But the principle is the same thing. It's nice to have local people there to give you a welcome and share the local knowledge when you arrive. And this third group um, we found when Tom Quinn put a post up on the County Clare Ireland genealogy group on Facebook, which now has over 3,000 members, a little less than the Genetic Genealogy Ireland group, which I noticed went through 4,000 this morning. And Tom just gave us that one line of his ancestry, and we very soon worked out a pedigree several generations back for him. He turned out to be related to the Lynches as well. And uh, he arranged to meet up in the Stella Maris. He's not in that picture. We forgot to take a picture before he left. Uh, but this lady Maria here in one of his close DNA matches, we all met up together in our office. The important thing when you go to a pub or a hotel or somewhere to meet up with people and bring your laptops to show, look at the DNA results, you eventually have to plug in. So we sit in that corner because there's a double plug socket behind the curtain. <laughs> <that we use. laughs> I'll come back to that. Anyway, back to Mr. Varna. Um, other man who I have swabbed is my friend Tommy. Here he is on his visit to the List of Varna Matchmaking Festival. Here is Willie Daly, who we saw earlier. And he matches up the man and the woman who peered through from either side at him. And Tommy actually met the real Willie Daly on the same day on his visit to List of Varna. He's told me I can use these pictures. Um, I think he knows they're up on Facebook, but his Facebook account is run by some of his so-called friends. <laughs> this particular friend, when he saw the picture, said, I believe Mr. Daly is a matchmaker, not a miracle worker. <laughs> Sorry, the, the comment is cut off there. Um, but, as I said, I swabbed Tommy. He has a fourth cousin in New Zealand, a wonderful man called Murray Ganad, who has transcribed the parish registers for Parry the whole parish and annotated them in a document that I runs to about 4,000 pages of local family history. And Murray contributed some money to the DNA project and said, Murray, I think his closest cousins in Clare were fourth cousins of so long since his ancestors went to New Zealand. Uh, but he said, can you find me a fourth cousin? I asked Tommy, would you be willing to swap? He said, well, as long as the guy in New Zealand pays. Uh, so he gave me his DNA, and I uploaded Tommy to the Get Match website, and his top match was an adoptee living in the States, who may be listening in on Facebook Live. Welcome to Cole if you are. Um, and it only took me a couple of hours with the book I had on Tommy's family history to identify her birth parents, and it turned out that they had married about a year after they put her up for adoption, and she managed to meet with her father and mother shortly afterwards. Sadly, her father died about a year later, and she had to cancel her planned trip to Ireland to meet the rest of the family because that was the week the father died. So Willie Daly may not be a miracle worker, but Gedmatch certainly is a miracle worker when it comes to Tommy. So, 
Matchmakers were part of tradition in Ireland for many centuries. Um, marriage in Ireland was not a romantic enterprise, it was an economic enterprise. It involved dowries and fortunes. I made another discovery recently through chasing DNA matches. I had this story of an immigrant from America who came back sometime after the US Civil War. I'm not sure that part of the story was true either, but he came back anyway with a fortune and he bought a farm. But I think this is a misinterpretation of what happened. There was a f farm which a wealthy farmer had bought for his son. The son died of TB, so the father said, well, we give the farm to the daughter as long as she marries somebody who comes in with a big dowry or a big fortune. And that's what the use of the fortune was as a dowry, not to purchase the farm. And he married a woman who already had the farm, which had come from her brother who died young of TB. Um, well, there's the tradition of Liz Dunvarna after the harvest season. Really, the matchmaking, as you would see from the old parish records, took place in what was known as Shrovetide. That's the period from Little Christmas Day, Mulligan Women's Christmas, as we call it in Ireland, the Feast of the Epiphany, the 6th of January. That was the time of year the matchmaking started, and it had to be all over by the start of Lent. So you would find on Shrove Tuesday of every year, um, huge number of marriages in most Irish parishes. And if you're not sure when Shrove Tuesday was, well, there's two ways you can find out. You can look in the parish register and see what day the most marriages are on, but there's also an online ecclesiastical calendar calculator that you can use. Um, and we've always had the problem of shotgun weddings. But we have it more today, maybe, than we did in the past. And DNA throws up lots of surprises. Some brides were pregnant when they married. Some of them were pregnant by their husbands. Some of them were pregnant by other men. But when they found them in that situation, it was probably because the man was somebody that they could not marry because of the economic circumstances that would have been frowned upon. And I have at least three cases that have come up. One in 1908, um, where the marriage took place in January. <coughs> the son was born in June. Something fishy about the dates there and the descendant did a DNA test and didn't match a second cousin once removed who she expected to match, and then a few more cousins were tested, and it turns out that the first son's male line descendant does not match on the Y chromosome the husband's male line descendant. One is half the group I, the other is half the group or. So we can be pretty sure in that case, yes, she was pregnant when she married, but she didn't marry the father. Second one I found out was in 1943 in England. That came about when a son and a grandchild tested and they matched as half nephew rather than full nephew. And there's another case in Dublin which came about when there was an inheritance to come from a half brother and the half siblings were all tested to prove there were half siblings and one turned out not to be a sibling at all. That was in the 1950s. And some of this goes back um, to the, the rumour tradition that the local landlord has what they call in French the, the Droit de Seigneur, or in Latin the just prima noctis, that maybe women might be impregnated by the landlord rather than the husband. There was a famous knight of Glynne in Glynne County Limerick called Rither and Amon for his womanising. This is an article from the Irish Independent recently about a colourful family history of lechery, infidelity and fanciful feats. And this man was rumoured to have had his way with most of the pretty girls in the parish on the night before their marriage. Uh, but he had various public mistresses as well. So there are probably other cases back there. There's another public figure in Clare, I'd better not make it, mention any names, but it is rumoured that if he did a Y-DNA test, he would match the local landlord because one of his female ancestors was working for the local landlord or had an encounter with the local landlord around the time that she married somebody with a completely different surname. <coughs> so I'm going to go into a little detail here on an example that only cropped up earlier this week. Sorry, I should have loaded up the map before I took the drink. Um, I was sitting at home on Monday hoping the house wouldn't blow down during the hurricane. Um, as one does, I started up my browser and the home page is my ancestry DNA matches with the most recent first. And I had to look down through them and I saw a name that I recognized and I said, I'll have to try and figure out the relationship. So this is West Clare. Um, 
from the Kentucky that panel. I can close it live on Google Maps. Oh, we did need that panel because the, the map is gone, so let me open it again. Uh, this is the Lupet Peninsula near Dunbeg, which is a very powerful part of the world because it has both the US president as a local golf course owner and the US vice president as a descendant of emigrants from the same parish within spitting distance of each other. Now I killed my man. Um, here he is. So here's Dunbeg Village. Here is Trump International, as it's now called. Here's the parish of Killard, where my Clancy ancestors lived. Here's the townland of Clohanbeg East. It's 13.4 kilometers away. I was intrigued to see the chart that Jean Piero put up earlier today of the average distance between the birthplaces of husbands and wives in English mar or British marriages between 1855 and 1955. And I thought, but 13.4, it's plausible. They're in different parishes. These people would have gone to Mass in Dunbeg Village. These people would have gone to Mass over here in Cree. So there wouldn't be that much mixing between them. It was quite a distance to go. Um, the Clancy Brothers, to some people, the Clancy Brothers are a great folk group. I hope some of them have sons. I'd love to get their DNA from my Clancy Y DNA project. But these Clancy Brothers were my great grandfather. Great, great grandfather George and three brothers. They all lived in the townland of Killard, which we saw on the map a little while ago. Um, Thomas had eight children, George had nine children, Michael had 15 children, Henry had 11 children. That's 43 fancy first cousins all living in the same townland at the same time, going to the same school. So I think the teacher had probably had trouble remembering all the, all the fancy names. Today, there's one Clancy family living in that town and still farming. Um, so the pattern I noticed, Thomas married a woman called Honora Nolan from Cotton Bag East, 13 kilometers to the east. And Henry, probably the youngest brother, married Honora Marinan from the same town land, Cotton Bag East, 13 kilometers away to the east. About as far as you'd expect anybody to go for, uh, to find a wife in those days of matchmakers. So, Honora Nolan's great great nephew and Honora <coughs> Marinan's great great nephew popped up on Monday as DNA matches. 28.3 uh, centimorgans shared across three segments. That's the sort of relationship we should be able to find a common ancestor. So, let's look and see what was going on in Griffith's valuation in Clopenbeg East. Here's the page from the parish of Kilmark Dwan. We scroll down and here's Clopenbeg East. And here's Michael Marinan, whose daughter, Honora, married one of the Clancy brothers, Henry. And here's Michael Nolan, whose daughter, Honora, married another of the Clancy brothers, Thomas. And they're listed right beside each other. And down here is another man whose descendant is in the DNA database, is John Tuberty. His great, great, great grandson, I think, is Ryan Tuberty, one of our leading television and radio broadcasters who did a great piece on DNA on his St. Patrick's Day program this year. So um, we'll probably find out he's related to these people as well. So we know they're listed close together. Does that mean they're living close together? Let's look at the map. Um, here's number two where, I remember who was living in which one, that's why I have the paper notes with me as well. Um, my place. Number three was Nolan's and number two was Marinan's. So when I drive up here, the directions of the Marinan house today are follow the signs for Nolan's because Nolan's have a tire business or something, so there are signs to the house. And there seems to be quite a distance between the two houses, uh, but in fact they're side by side and one has an avenue coming in from that direction and the other has an avenue coming in from that direction. And they seem further away from the road than they are in practice. So these two women came from spitting distance of each other, and they moved 13 kilometers away, and they married two brothers. And the Tuberty house was number six over here. <coughs> um, so what else can we find out about these two families? Well, we have a pedigree of the Marinan family, which I got this summer. 
written by a nun who's no longer with us and given to her sister, another nun who passed it on to her niece, who passed it on to me. And up at the top here, she wasn't even sure, was he Michael Marnin or Mark Marnin? This is the Marnin in Griffith's valuation, but he married an O'Brien. And what about the Nolan family? Mrs. Nolan is buried in Kilmithill Cemetery, further over to the east again than one might expect. And the inscription says, you can read it on the Clare Library website, which, if you follow that link. Here lie the remains of Ellen Nolan, alias O'Brien, who departed this life February 15th, 1855, aged 64 years, erected by her beloved husband, Mr. Michael Nolan, Tlachan Beg, for her and posterity. So now we have evidence that both Mrs. Clancy's, both called Honora, both from the same townland, both had mothers called O'Brien. We haven't found Mrs. Marinan's grave. We don't know her first name. Only her surname appears on the handwritten pedigree. We also have a couple of user-submitted family trees of this family. One says that Mrs. Marinan was not an O'Brien at all. She was Anna Maroney. <coughs> and that's put up by Bob Moeller, who has been to Cahan Beg to see whether his Michael Marinan, uh, whose children immigrated to the US, was the Michael Marinan who lived in Blaham Bay. And there's another lady who has put up this tree again, saying that Katie Marinan is the brother who stayed in Blaham Bay, and that his father was Mary Ann Mahoney. Now, Maroney and Mahoney are two different readings of the same typewritten document, because I have seen the original typewritten document, and it's a bit blurry. But how many, one has Anna and the other has Mary Ann, I don't know. And actually, the first time I went to Clahan Beg East to visit my third cousin once removed, uh, Brendan Marinan, I was sent up with a DNA kit. He had to spit three times for ancestry before they managed to get his autosomal DNA results, but eventually they got a good sample. But I had to swap him in case we eventually had to go to family tree DNA to do the autosomal, plus so that we could do the Y DNA. And it was on Bob Moeller's insistence that I did that. And these two trees have now been discredited because Brendan came out not matching the descendants who thought that they went back to Michael of Clohan Beg. They went back to another Michael Marinan, probably of Kaharosh, elsewhere in there. So what have we got now? We're looking for patterns in our data. Research of any sort is about spotting obvious patterns or surprising trends in data. We can also do data mining, which is digging a little too deep, which some people do with their DNA data finding patterns that are not obvious. But here we have a pretty good pattern. We have two next door neighbors. Their sons-in-law were brothers. They were both O'Briens. They were possibly related. Were they sisters? They both called daughters Honora. Daughters were typically called after the grandmother. Were the two Honoras called after the same grandmother? If so, the two people who showed up as matches this week, Brendan and Michael, would be fourth cousins. And Brendan and Michael are good friends and didn't know they were related. Um, so what I did then is I went to my genealogy database, which I keep in Ancestral Quest. There's me with my ancestors back five generations. Everybody needs one of these databases. The offline software is far more powerful than the online family tree websites like Ancestry. So in my notes, I have put a tag saying get match, and here's my get match numbers. I've done that for everyone that I have found on the DNA databases. So I filter this um, and the, put in the filter, show any individuals where the notes field has a get match tag. There are 992 of them. And 967 of them are connected in some way by marriage to me. But what we can do is um, Jump to Mrs. Nolan, whose number I have here somewhere. The two O'Brien sisters, one, two, four, two, two, I want to go to. And I can say, now show me all the people who are descended from Ellen Nolan, Nae O'Brien's ancestors. Select them. 999 generations of ancestors, 999 generations of descendants. It has found precisely three who are in the DNA databases. Gives me their names. Michael is the man who's just got his results this week. He's not a get match yet. I'll be meeting him tomorrow to get him on to get match. But John McMahon is on get match. 
Then I did the same things for Mrs. Marnan, who is uh, <coughs> 113913. We're just trying to find her and search and turn that off. Hear that. <coughs> Select those who are related to Mrs. Marnan and in the DNA databases. Um, sorry, let's jump to the wrong one. Again, here, select, okay, there are 17 of them. Seven of those are on GetMatch. So now what I'd like to do is take the one descendant of Mrs. Nolan, who's on GetMatch, and the seven descendants of Mrs. Marinan who are on GetMatch, and see do they match. So I created this autosomal matrix. Um, Blow that up a little bit for you, I think. So, bit selection. Okay. It looks different without a projector. So, here's the one DNA person we have on GetMatch who is descended from the Nolans. Here are the seven we have who are descended from the Marlins. You can see that um, all these are fairly hot cells. They're all confirmed close relations, except for about two cells. But here's the Nolan descendant that we had no idea was related to the Marnin descendants until last week. And he's showing up 26 centimorgans, 40 centimorgans, 18, 10, 23, 14, 10. It's pretty good for fourth cousin, fourth cousin once removed. I adjusted them all to a fourth cousin scale. In other words, I doubled the numbers for the fourth cousins once removed, so I'm not comparing apples and oranges. And I worked out the average is 31.4 centimorgans shared. The Shared Centimorgan Project by Blaine Bettinger that lots of people have talked about found an average of 35 centimorgans shared between four cousins. Have I proved that the two O'Briens were sisters and that the descendants of fourth cousins? I haven't proved it, but it's very strong circumstantial evidence. But there's more that we can do here. Uh, if you find two, two women that you think were sisters, you'd love to know do they have the same mitochondrial haplogroup? So you can trace down female line descendants from both women. And I did that. And I found one of my cousins as well here in the audience who was going to come today. No, I don't see him. He doesn't seem to have made it. Uh, but he's getting the, I get paid a free kit for doing this talk. And that's going to be used to analyze Owen's mitochondrial DNA. And that will tell me what was the mitochondrial DNA of his great, great, great grandmother, um, Mrs. Marnan. Then we need to find somebody who descends in the female line from our next door neighbor, Mrs. Nolan, and get their mitochondrial DNA. And there were three sisters from that line called Maloney, who ended up in Chicago. I mentioned the vice president earlier, his great grandmother, the American vice president's great grandmother, was a Maloney from Dunbeg. This is the same Maloney family. I'm not going to go into this story if you want a wonderful story about. How I managed to figure out that that photo and that photo taken 60 years apart were the same woman, and there were people looking for what happened to her and people looking for what became of her. Um, she's the daughter to the married Maloney. But anyway, I put that family tree together, and her descendants owe me a favor, and they have the mitochondrial DNA I'm looking for, so I hope we'll persuade some of them to do it. And if the two mitochondrial DNA tests come back as matches, I'll be 100% certain that those two ladies were sisters. If they don't come back as matches, I tear it all up and start again. Um, there's more we can do. My cousin Cindy is down there at the back. She has no Marnan blood, but she has spent her last two years putting together the family tree of all the Marnans in the world. And when I checked her tree for the Marnans, she has Timothy, who got the home farm, Honora, who married the fancy, and she speculated there's this woman, Mary, who... Um, might be a sister, she's a Marnin, she's from the right parish, she's of the right age group. There's only two Marnin families in the parish, and this seemed the more likely one. And I said, well, let's see, can we get mitochondrial DNA from Mary's descendants and see does she really belong in this family? And thanks to Rory O'Shea, who's over here, he has loved his cousin, who happens to be a mitochondrial de descendant of Maria, or Mary Carrick, and we're waiting for those results to come in. And that will give us a clue as to what, the, what mitochondrial DNA to expect or not expect from the other tests when they come in 
but I'm actually fairly sure now that Cindy's guess is wrong and that that woman is from the other Marinan family at the other end of the parish. Because I did a little bit more, I added um, Rory's cousin, the Carrick descendant, to this matrix, and he would be um, a third cousin, I think, to most of these people. But when I did the numbers anyway, I was expecting to get an average of 35. This time I got an average of 6.6. .6. So purely on the autosomal results, I think we can already throw out the hypothesis that Mrs. Carrick belonged to this Marinan family, and she belonged to the other Marinan family at the other end of the parish. So let me jump ahead to another completely different case, another adoption case that landed on my lap a couple of weeks ago. And this again arises from my little visit to the Marinans in Plahambeg East. Um, Jim Hammer, I've got permission to, to name him here. If you read his Wikipedia page, you would see that he was adopted. Any baseball fans from the, among the Americans in the audience? Anybody ever hear of Jim Hammer from the Baltimore Orioles? I guess he's reasonably well known. And his wife has decided it's time to try and trace his birth family. You can read all about his life story there. So he's a very distant match to me, six centimorgans across one DNA segment. I don't think I would have appeared on the radar, except that my cousin Brendan has 65 centimorgans shared across five segments. So that was enough to attract Jim's wife's attention. He has a little bit of a problem with his adoption records because his adoptive father died and his adoptive mother remarried, and Palmer is his adoptive mother's second husband's surname. So his present surname doesn't match the surname he was given when he was adopted. Um, he's fishing in all the gene pools. He has a closest match of 273 centimorgans, which is predicted to be first cousin once removed, or second cousin, or maybe second cousin once removed. I tend to use this table recently rather than the plain Bettinger table. I'm a statistician. I love probabilities. This is on the DNA Geek website. And for every level of shared DNA, it gives you the probability that the relationship falls in the various categories, siblings, grandparents, first cousins, first cousins once removed. And we were looking for 273 there. So that's where I get roughly 20% of first cousin once removed, 60% second cousin, 20% probability second once removed. Dead man, she has the same person as his closest match. Family tree DNA sent off a sample only a couple of weeks ago. We're still waiting for the Y DNA results. We tried to transfer the file from ancestry DNA to family tree DNA and we keep getting error messages. There's actually a small number of ancestry DNA files get a raw data file with about 10,000 missing SNPs out of 600,000 family tree DNA rejects them. There's this long thread in the family tree DNA forums. Somebody has recently actually written a little program to fill in the blanks so that family tree DNA will upload it. Don't know what the source of the glitch is, but we get around it eventually. Uh, there were some disparaging things said earlier in the weekend about the MyHeritage matching algorithm, which has thrown up a lot of false negatives for people who are expected to be in the second cousin or first cousin once removed range. But Jim has got a good match with 358 centimorgans shared DNA on my heritage. And it looks genuine because he's from the same family as his other matches. His close matches include a number of descendants of Thomas Maroney and Mary O'Dee, who married in about 1850. And he already had some inkling that his birth father's surname might have been Maroney. So that all began to make sense. But then when these close matches were persuaded to upload their data from family tree DNA or ancestry DNA to get match. That put the cat among the pigeons or the fly in the ointment or the spanner in the works, as other people have said over the weekend, because he shared 41.7 centimorgans on his X chromosome, which came from his mother with one of the Moroni descendants. He didn't share it with her sister, if it came from their father, he would match both of them because two sisters get exactly the same X chromosome from their father. So it must come from their mother because a mother gives her daughters different recombinations of her two X chromosomes. So now we know there's a Moroni ancestor 
on the mother's side, maybe there's a Moroni ancestor on the father's side as well, get matches another lovely trick, you can run, are your parents related? It says no, they're not related. So maybe just the whole story got garbled, um, or maybe there are unrelated Moronis on both sides. Ancestry DNA does not give you this information about the X chromosome. If you send your DNA to Ancestry and don't copy it to get match, you are missing critical clues like this. I don't know why Ancestry doesn't give it, but it doesn't. Um, and Jim actually has a page from the birth index for New York City, which has a male Moroni born on the date on which Jim celebrates his birthday, and the mother's surname is just given with the Sandex code A530, which matches names like Kennedy, and we have now identified a Kennedy married to a Moroni, and we're beginning to wonder, is that where the Kennedy and Moroni surnames came? It's a work in progress, but one reason I like this was Jim's wife sent me in an email the other day, it's official, DNA is my cocaine, I've got to have it. We're all addicted. And Morris is gone now, but over the course of the last week, we decided Morris's next conference has got to be Genealogists Anonymous for those of us who are addicted to DNA. <laughs> I'm talking about, you missed the, the punchline, it's official. DNA is my cocaine, I've got to have it. That's from an adoptee's wife in the US. Um, so she'll join Genealogists Anonymous too when we set it up. <laughs> So I've never believed in this thing about six degrees of separation. I showed you a couple of pictures earlier. Um, Tom lives in Maine, Maria lives in England. There's Maria with us in the Stella Maris. They both have holiday homes in Kilkee. They discovered that there were DNA matches when the results came in. And on chromosome 20, from location 2 million to 44 million, they have a shared segment of 60.7 centimorgans. 6,677 SNPs. That's indicative of a pretty close relationship. They know their ancestors. They both have ancestors from the town of Kilkee. They can go back to their great-grandparents. There's no surname in common. Um, there's no geography in common on the other sides of their family. They could be fourth cousins. And 60.7 centimorgans has about a 1 in 500 chance of surviving in two fourth cousins, but this is what I said about data mining. This is the extreme tail of the distribution that has jumped out and hit them in the face. Um, it's not a randomly selected comparison. So there will be, this is the one in 500 case out of the tail of the distribution. So I said, let's see, can we find, is there anybody else who shares this segment? We ran the matching segment search on GetMatch and these people, and I came up with this triangulation involving a gentleman called Pete. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Um, because Pete happened to be, here's Pete, he happened to be staying in the same hotel at the same time on a visit from Cincinnati. <laughs> so that's a lot less than six degrees of separation. We still haven't found the common ancestor of the three of them, but they happened to be in the same hotel on the same night, one from Maine, one from Cincinnati, one from London, and they triangulate on this DNA segment. So what have we learned from these autosomal examples? As genealogists, we combine our family histories by matching up three categories of information. We have the oral traditions that are passed down through the generations, that handwritten Marnon pedigree with Mert or Michael married to O'Brien, that sort of thing, or the letter that my grandfather got in the 1940s from my grandmother's uncle, listing the four Hansi brothers and their wives and their 47 children, which I could not have proven from the parish records because those four brothers were born before the start of the surviving parish records. Then we have the archival sources used by the traditional genealogists, the census returns, um, the birth, marriage and death records, the church records, published genealogies and so on. And then we add the DNA evidence to this. DNA does not work on its own. You still have to do the hard slog and it would usually reconcile the oral and archival traditions. It would sometimes refute them. There may be MPEs, not the parents expected. What do you have to do to get the most out of your autosomal results? I have a page on my website in which I go into details about the hows and the whys, which will give you all the links. 
and I'll be giving a talk on the 20th of November for those who are still in Dublin to the Irish Genealogical Research Society on this. You've got to upload your pedigree chart to Ancestry DNA so that people who see your DNA match see what you know of your ancestry, see that you're interested, might find another ancestor for you and will be tempted to contact you. You have to upload the pedigree chart and your DNA data to get match and to family tree DNA if you've had ancestry DNA do the lab analysis. You've got to make sure all the DNA kits you manage are matched to the correct person in the correct family tree and that way you make life much easier for yourself, much easier for your matches and make it much more likely that you're going to make contact with somebody who has a provable relationship with you and who has information that you didn't already have. So I should have about five minutes left in which I'm going to run through completely different topic, the Y-DNA results from County Clare. I think we saw 840 odd members of the project on the live feed. I did this a couple of days ago when there were 837. If you have an ancestor who lived in County Clare, you're welcome to join the project. You just go to that page and if you're not already a member, there'll be a button over here beside the room that says join and you click on it. Um, there are 317 men who have Y-DNA results out of those 837 members and I have grouped them hard slow manually, just learned from James Irvin in the last talk, there's a program out there that now auto automates the whole thing, I've colour coded them, the green ones are half the group E, the blues are half the group G, the whites are half the group I, the turquoise are half the group J, the pink are half the group R1A, Gray is top level or 1B, and various subgroups of that. Pretty much everyone is half the group or. Um, sorry, it's not the right place. Okay, so I wanted to go. So out of the 317 sets of results, 88% of them are in half the group or, 9% half the group I, and an odd stray and a few other half the groups. Within half the group or, 98% of them are or 1B. Um, a few strays in OR1A, and one person who they can't assign to either OR1A or OR1B because he has some unusual STR results. Um, that 86% of the project then is in OR1B, that's higher than the 81% that Margaret reported earlier for the Ireland YDNA project. These are people reporting they have some ancestry from Clare, it doesn't necessarily mean their male line ancestry is Clare, my male line goes back to Roscommon, I'm in the project. So it's not, I haven't time to get everybody who wants to get in. I let everybody in who's, who claims they have their ancestry. So within the OR1B group, there are M269 is the top of the half of the group. There's 20 people who we can't decide which half of it they belong to. <coughs> U106, I belong to. There's only 4% of the OR1Bs in U106. P3. 12, again, the most common haptic group in Ireland, 88% of the OR1Bs belong to that. And then we have two brothers who are in S1194, which is a tiny little branch that sits at the same level as those two. Uh, within the P312s, 89% of them are in L21, which again is the most common haptic group in most of Ireland. And within that we get down to the interesting level, how did they break down into these known haplotypes that were identified some years ago as being very common in Ireland. We expect a large proportion to be the Dal Passion Irish Type 3, which includes the O'Briens, the descendants of Brian Baru and related families. Brian Baru ruled from Killaloo in County Clare. There's 28% of the men in, within the L21s are from that branch. I'm surprised that as many as 20% from the M222, that's the so-called Nile of the Nine Hostages, Y-DNA, which goes back to the northwest of Ireland, Neil Neelock in Donegal. Um, there are two other widely recognized Irish groups. There's only 6% in the South Irish group and only two people in the Monster Type 1 group. I would have expected a little more. Then there's L513, Z253, that's the decent one, is it, or 255? 255. Um, the 513s are mostly thanks to Rory recruiting lots of O'Shea's. And the surprising one is the L1336s, and having discussed this with Luke McInerney, the best medieval historian in County Clare, we've decided these are the Kirk and Rose surnames from way up in Northwest Clare. 
and they include the Marnets, uh, Daberans, Donnellans, a couple of Cunninghams, a few O'Loughlins, that sort of surname, and then there's a few strays. But the interesting thing is how many common surnames there are for more than one person has joined the project, and they come from completely different genetic roots. So we have two Brennans, one in half of group I, one in half of group four. I manage the Cansey project, which you can follow that link to visit. Um, we have some Clancy's are Kirk and Rowe Clancy's, some are Dad Passion Clancy's, and there's one stray claims his ancestors come from Wexford, who's an R1A. Um, and discussing this with Luke, there were Clancy's up in northwest Clare in Kirk and Rowe, there were Clancy's down in southeast Clare in uh, Chaddery, near Newmarket and Fergus, and there have been connections between the two families since the 1400s, and Luke and others have assumed that they're the same family, but it now looks like they have different DNA signatures, and they were not, in fact, the same family. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. OD is another project. I gave a talk here last year, and I discovered on the recording afterwards, the first man up to me at the end of the project was James OD, who's made it here today, um, and he pushed his card in my hand and said, I want to talk to you about Freddie Kerr, who was an old family friend from Kilkee. So I had to ring him, and the next thing, I'm the administrator with James of the OD DNA project. And we're looking for ODs because there's a big gathering coming up next May in Dysart OD in County Clare for the 700th anniversary of the Battle of Dysart OD. And the results are a bit all over the place. One is Apple Group E, there's five dad passions, there's three who we can't place anywhere more recent than P312. And the we sent out a bulk email to all the ODs on the Family Tree DNA database during the week, so a lot of others have joined, and when this conference is over, I'll have time to analyze those new ones. But then there are other surnames where there's no variation. Uh, the Corries and the Curries, there are four of them in the project, not known relatives, I think, they're all Dow Passions. Cusacks, all Dow Passions. Milikins, all with a very low level identified half of the group. They're all close STR matches, and those who have tested have the same SNP, so I'm pretty sure they're all going to be A15201s. The Marinans, we have six of them. They can all go back six or seven generations without finding a common ancestor. They're extremely close on their STR matches, and this BY19488 seems to be the terminal SNP for the two who've done the big Y test, and we've just got that approved by Family Tree DNA as something that's available for single SNP tests, so we're going to be ordering a few more of those in the next few days. And Rory's O'Shea, six of them are L513s, five of them are known relatives, or people who've always acknowledged each other as relatives, even though they've forgotten who the common ancestor is. So that's just for the YDNA geeks in the audience, a quick run through what you find in Claire. Uh, there's lots more on my website. Um, including my Beginner's Adventures in Genetic Genealogy, which has been growing and growing for the last few years, which you're welcome to read. And I guess the, all that remains to say as the last speaker of the week is for me to ask you all to thank Morris Peace for his great efforts over the last three days and the last five years in putting such a wonderful conference together. Uh, we might have a couple of minutes for questions before we, we have turn a few minutes for questions, yes. So questions questions for Patty. I, I think it's absolutely fantastic the work that you've done with Clare Root Society, and I wish every county in Ireland had uh, somebody of your calibre doing this type of analysis because it really would help uh, a lot of the diaspora Irish as well to reconnect with their with their roots here in Ireland. And of course it would help a lot of the local Irish to actually find out that you are related to your neighbours and you just never really knew it. Question here. Hi, my name's Jo and I'm over from New Zealand and I'm researching the McInerney family from Coolrash and I got told I had to come and see you because you would know all about them. <laughs> well, I've, I've dealt with a couple of McInerney cases recently and I had to put up a comment on our Facebook discussion. More than 1% of the population of County Clare in the 1911 census was called McInerney's. There are McInerney's in every parish and probably in every town. And, but, Talk to me afterwards and we'll see what we can do for you. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Comment from uh, Debbie? <coughs> do 
you've ever managed to sleep at night with all this work that you've done? <laughs> How do you manage to do so Some, much? Sometimes, sometimes I sleep during time. the day to make up for staying up all night. <laughs> you have an identical twin you haven't told us about. Any? An identical twin you haven't told us about. No, my grandfather was the identical twin. Morris asked, did anyone have double first cousins in their family tree? <laughs> And uh, there were two Waldron identical twins, and they married two sisters, and there's descendants of both in the audience today. Right. And twins ran in the family on my mother's side as well. I had two uncles who were twins. But no, I'm just one person. <laughs> we have a question from Cindy Wood. I will answer the question on the sleep. I'm his cousin, and I'm the one that's doing the barnings. I live in the U.S., and I will frequently go online at 11 my time in New York and find him online at 4 a.m. his time. So no, he doesn't sleep. And Cindy has weird ideas about the right time to phone people. We needed to talk to Brendan recently and she said, you can't phone him now. It's nine o'clock at night, he'd be going to bed. And I said, I can't phone him now. It's nine o'clock at night, he'd be going out playing cards. <laughs> Any other questions at all? Any other comments? Okay, well it just remains, although we have, a, we have a comment over here, I'm going to come around this way. Lovely. It's a general question. How would you get over the difficulty of people who are reluctant to cooperate and give information? Um, we've been very lucky. I haven't been turned down by too many people. Um, so we talked them. Don't push them too hard. But some people you know, they're never, never going to give, give up. Never going to give out the information. I'm reminded actually of going to visit my, my great aunt. Our great aunt, there's a few of her great nephews here in the audience, with my father many years ago. And I was trying to sweet talk her into telling us some of the family secrets. And my father typed up, well, we're trying to write down the family tree and we hope you'll be able to help us. And she clammed up and wouldn't say any more. So. You don't tell them that you're writing it down. You don't tell them that you're compiling a family tree. You just do it as casual conversation and try and get two clues out of them that way. Michael has a question now. The back. Okay, Michael has a question. I'm going to come around. Or an answer. Today. Michael always has answers, not questions. Mm -hmm. uh, since, uh, since I was mentioned the dispatches, uh, uh, just to comment, you know. You talk about writing down, and it's crucial when people are not want to give information or write sweet talk mentions, you know. But another thing you could have is when you could record them. Sometimes I do that because my memory can be as, and my attention span can be as good as Paddy, and I said, well, I have to be safe five minutes. So when you, go, when you go back afterwards and listen to the recording, if you tell your laptop your own time, just type in the information and transfer the to the work process. And, and no, you've I just think. reminded me I was supposed to record in Camtasia and I forgot, so I hope Jared has gone all there. Oh, you, 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 you <laughs> record. That's not like you. Uh, but anyway, no, I have to say that Penny mentioned a couple of say on he mentioned the Stella Naris in the office, you know, there's a couple of more offices and around the area, but that's the general room we all need up because it's been the key, it's a great water and so on. And the other thing was yeah, Penny has Got me involved. I was always interested in history and local history and family connections and so on. So, we had gone to Paddy many years ago, but in recent years, and we on local radio and so on, and uh, Freddie got me into the genealogy and we got me to do with the DNA. And so, I ended up with thousands of relations, you know, and tendencies and so on. But I, I come to the conclusion that a place like Wesley, I've mentioned the Lopez Peninsula, or the Great Fair area. I have often met people you know, that, that say to me, well, can you tell us have you an idea of where, and they mention the name, can you have an idea of where it's going to come from? And I'd say, well, see, let's go there, pick it up, throw it, and I'd guarantee you, you'll hit a relation. And, and that's as good a way as writing out. <laughs> and that's more or less what it's there, because with Richard Lerner and the other talks, you know, people are not moving very far and so on, you know, and people have married in their own area. So, uh, DNA Thanks very much. Well, sadly, that is the last we have time for for this uh, year's Genetic Genealogy Ireland 2017. 
It uh, just remains for me to thank our sponsors, Family Tree DNA, all the volunteers on the Family Tree that we've had here today that have made this one of the best conferences that we've ever had. And for you guys in the audience, uh, we've had the biggest audience, and we're just going from strength to strength. And lastly, of course, um, uh, Paddy Ward for giving us a fantastic finishing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.